Hello, everybody. My name is Yossi Sheffi, and I'm a professor of engineering at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and I'm the director of the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. First, I would like to thank the good people of JD.com for inviting me to address the Global Smart Supply Chain Forum today. The MIT Center for Transportation Logistics has been operating for many years in Ningbo in China, and I've been to China many, many times, dozens and dozens of times, and enjoyed every time. I wish I could be with you in person, but it's not going to happen this time around. What I'm going to talk today is about my book, which just came out last week. So let me just share the screen with you and show you what it looks like. So this is it. And my friend from the center at Ningbo um, translated the cover of the book to Chinese. But that's all the Chinese that I'm going to talk about today. Instead of uh, talking about this, let me talk about the subject of my conversation today. While China has come out of the economic impact of fighting the, the pandemic, the rest of the world is still experiencing many cases, hospitalization, and death. However, we're starting to see what the long-term impact of the pandemic are going to be in terms of business and supply chain. Let me talk about some of the biggest lessons and forecasts that I found out in the months that I've been working day and night on getting this book out in time. I've interviewed dozens of executives and view many, many documents and look at the media, of course, all over the world to come up with a picture of what happened and what the world is gonna be like going forward. The first point is that they, just like the people who were badly affected, it was the old and the sick, they were vulnerable to the disease and many of them died. Similarly, companies who were weak before, overextended, had questionable business model, they are going out of business. For example, US department stores. In 1998, the sales of US department stores were over $30 billion. In December 2019, they were down to $11 billion and then down to $8 billion in the few months since the uh, start of the pandemic. Many of them just going out of business. Many departments are going out of business. Second point, some companies were ready. They met the supply chain. They understood where product were produced, where and which product the, the part goes into, which, which final product it goes into, and which customers it going to. So in case of a disruption, at say a supplier, they can quickly calculate the value at risk. They know which product this supplier is supplying. They know which customer the final product go into, and they can set priorities. They are also ready to deal with disruptions. What do I mean by ready to deal? The company are successful. They very quickly sent an emergency management center and good companies know that there are disruptions all the time, so they have a process for setting emergency management centers. They have good communication, and they have the hub of the communication is this emergency management center. They have clear decision-making authority because people may fall sick. The, the good company know that they have to review suppliers. They have to make sure that suppliers are still in business, and they have to look at many more items beyond just, is it good price, is it good customer? They have to look even at the human resources um, processes of the supply to see if they keep, if, they, if their uh, workers are healthy and they'll have the capacity to produce. This company review product and customers. In many cases, companies don't have enough for all customers. So setting up priorities ahead of time, understand how you do all the trade-offs between customers when you cannot supply all customers, but you want to keep good customer relationship, companies follow processes. And I talk in my book about many of these processes with, uh, with examples. 
as we go into a recession, at least in the Western world, there's greater focus on cash as is in any recession. But one has to be very careful with extending payment to suppliers because if the small suppliers can be put in risk if they are not paid in time. Another thing that most companies do is reduce the number of SKUs in order to keep supply and make sure that the supermarket shelves are full, they reduce the number of uh, SKUs and focus on the fast and big sellers. This also helps for cost because you have less product change as you run your uh, production. And finally, it's the time to make tough decisions. They say crisis is a terrible thing to wait. It's time to look at all your customers, all your product, all your employees, who is making it and who is not. The last point that we see companies are doing is they have tools for omnichannel. This is particularly relevant for retailers. Uh, for example, Domino, the pizza uh, retailer, had, had an app that started developing just at the end of 2019 that allowed people to pick up uh, pizzas at the store. They set the time, they bring it to the, and the uh, and when the time is set, you get a, a text and somebody comes out of the store and put it in the trunk of the car. They, they did only experiment in 10 stores, now they extended it to all the stores. As a result, the sale went up 16%, while competitors went out of business. The third um, element that we see is, of course, the growth of e-commerce. Uh, JD.com, Alibaba, all went up 34% in sales. But even companies who do not sell only online, companies like Target and Lowe's and Walmart, their the e-commerce business went up tremendously. Companies understood that uh, even if you didn't do e-commerce before, it became a necessity. It's not a question, do you want to do it? You have to do it to stay in business. And as a result of this, e-commerce companies all over the world are investing more and more in fulfillment centers and distribution centers close to the customer. The fourth thing that we see is that companies are installing digital tools at much faster clip. Not only the leaders, but everybody. Part of it is because the tools are becoming cheaper and more powerful. In the book, I have a story of a small family-owned uh, retailers near Boston that used to serve institutions. They used to serve prisons and universities and restaurants, all of those, all these stops, and they quickly changed to serving consumers. They had to learn on the fly how to do a website, how to do marketing, how to do telephone help, how to do, how to send email to all, uh, to all the customers, how to work on customer service. This does the husband and wife thing. And they did a great job and they stayed in business and hired all the 20 drivers that they had to let go before uh, in the early days of the pandemic. Important areas that we see are putting more technology in communication, in visibility. Give you an example of what the General Motors is doing now. People in the plant have the daily production schedule. They also have the inventory on hand. And they, many times they see that for the next, for the same day, for the next day, for another day, they don't have enough inventory to do the production schedules that marketing and sales want. So now they have the ability to identify shortage by part, by part number. So they know what they're missing, but there's a company that gives them what is happening on all inbound trucks into the plant? And there are 40 or 50,000 inbound trucks going to all the plants, the assembly plants, the engine plants, the uh, transmission plants. They look at all of those. They identify which part is on which truck. And they can reschedule all the trucks. So one truck will stop somewhere and unload some part. Another truck would pick it up. And they re-optimize it, all the movement, rerouting, relay, offloading, you know, uploading, send new instructions to all the truck. 
They ensure that no shortage is developed in any plan and they update the plan, the plans of all the plans. Think about the computer power that's needed to do it. It's done, of course, with a lot of AI, with a lot of uh, um, optimization, some of it even classical optimization, but infused by a lot of AI machine learning. Talking about AI, it's using the sixth point here is AI is using more and more area, including logistics and transportation. AI is the engine of autonomous vehicle, be it curbside delivery, drone, warehouse management system, warehouse robotics, autonomous trucks, back office automation, forecasting. For example, uh, the company that I mentioned before does ETA to the plan much more accurately because they take a lot more information, like even the length of the queue at the Mexican border into consideration when they make the ETA. And of course, weather and a lot of other things. We see much more use of cloud computing, not only by traditional companies, but even smaller companies understand that through the cloud, it is much easier to install, manage, uh, applications and get, get them to work much faster. We see, of course, communication, maybe other area. Telehealth, uh, you go to the doctor now in the United States, which is still, of course, as many cases, you do it online. There are telehealth uh, uh, specific application for medical um, communication. Universities, universities completely change. They are done 90, 95% online. You can see that companies are also working a lot from home. And the question is what will happen to cities? What will happen to downtown offices? People can now work from anywhere. So the, and the next point is there is a lot, a lot more work from home, but this, some of it is gonna stay. Even though the, Interestingly, it may bring the opposite effect of what the Western media is talking about. We see a lot of uh, articles about the end of globalization. Well, I'm not so sure, because if people can work from anywhere, then there will be more globalization of white color, of office worker. They can work from anywhere. If you work in Boston and you can, uh, if, if your office is in Boston, and you, can, and you want to live in New York, you may also live in Shenzhen. You may also live in uh, Madrid. It doesn't matter where you are. Now you have to adjust the hours, but you can live wherever you want. There's also a lot of media talking about the end of just-in-time, the end of the Toyota production system. Again, this is overhyped. It's not happening. The, the Toyota production system is too important. It's the biggest change to manufacturing since the Industrial Revolution. It brings competitive advantage. Now, governments may be able to keep critical supplies of some medical supplies and some other supplies. For businesses, it's very hard. They're, they're becoming uncompetitive if they keep too much inventory. So I don't see it happening. Finally, a lot of Western media is talking about leaving China. No, again, this is something that I don't see happening. And many of the companies that I talk to don't see happening. Many companies spend decades develop not only final assembly, but the entire supply chain, a whole ecosystem of business in China, of suppliers, their supplier, their supplier, their supplier. They have the relationship, they have the expertise. This cannot just, change in a minute. Uh, people now stay in China, not so much because of labor costs. Labor costs in China have been going up significantly. So people are staying, going to China because of the sophistication of suppliers and the existence of, as I said, the entire ecosystem. Also, of course, the Chinese market is large and growing. So for example, garment manufacturing is leaving China going to Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, because the costs there are one seventh of what they are in China. But these are things that require very little uh, capital investment and the labor and a lot of labor, cheap labor of women sewing and uh, sewing garment. Sophisticated manufacturer, however, stays in China. So for example, 
clothing export in, from China to the world in 2010 was 37%. 37% of all clothing uh, around the world were exported from China. 2008 years later, 2008, it went down to 31% because even Chinese companies were leaving China. However, textile manufacturing grew from 30% to 38% of, uh, of world export. Why? Because making garment is labor intensive and little capital investment. Textile is the opposite, sophisticated, automated, machine driven, so it stays in China. Finally, let me just say that as a result of the pandemic, we have a few worries. First of all, uh, you know, for the world, first of all, sustainability. I see a lot less attention in the coming years to environmental sustainability and global warming because we have to get back to business. So despite all the talk of Western companies of going back, they have to get back to business. People will be poorer. They will not be able to pay more for sustainable product. So I see sustainability, the, the emphasis on sustainability going down. Another thing that uh, took place is the growing inequality, both internally, I'm talking on the Western world, that's what I know, between people who have, between people who can work from home and people who cannot work from home, between people who have access, good access to internet and the ability to study and work from home and people who cannot. But also I see growing inequality between countries. I see countries in Africa that, or countries in, uh, in Latin America and some part of Asia going backwards, going backwards instead of mortality and health and GDP and business formation. On the other hand, rich countries like, like the US, like Europe, and of course China, which was already beyond the pandemic, can invest and get further ahead. Finally, I see uh, maybe, no, there are many worries, but the last one that I'll mention it is industrial concentration. The big companies are simply getting bigger and this has impact on innovation because the big companies usually are not as innovative as smaller entrepreneurial companies. And when big companies are simply buying small companies, it's not clear that innovation will continue around the world in the same pace. Okay, let me stop here. And I want to in thank the people at JD.com for inviting me to speak. And I wish JD.com and all the guests a very productive forum. Thank you very much. I enjoyed talking to you.